and we're recording. So tonight's night one of the orphan spirit. My dear, last last time when I did the mentorship, I actually taught this myself. Um, but this time, oh, this wow. year when I was putting the um, lineup up, like what we were going to go through, because it's different every time I do it. And when I got to the orphan yeah. spirit, I just heard God say, ask Marianne to teach it. Um, because I know that she has a lot more experience or a lot more revelation and understanding of how this spirit works. Cause she's been teaching it a lot longer um, and been dealing with it for, I don't know how long, but for some time and I'll it's let her, 95. oh, well, so I'll let her explain <laughs> all of that with you. And I'm just going to sit back. We're going to let her teach. And then at the end, we'll jump in, ask questions, do whatever we need to. So Marianne, it's all yours, dear. All right. Well, thank you, girls. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I live in Inez, Kentucky, but I went to the Ukraine on a missions trip and I went for two weeks with a group and then I came back and I felt like I was supposed to go back. And probably six months later, I went back and I moved there and I stayed for almost three years. And while I was there, I worked with different churches. I had a church base there, but worked with the satellite churches that we had there, but I also worked with a bunch of orphanages too. So while I was there, I experienced um, personalities, all kinds. Of, so I had a roommate from Germany and she worked with street children. Her name was Nicole and she's still there. She married a Ukrainian guy and they actually are in Odessa and they run three different children's homes. And it's just crazy. So anyway, so I watched her walk through rejection with these children and different things. And we, we actually said, well, they have some kind of spirit about them. It's not a spirit, but I mean, it can be, but it's a mentality that they have a way of thinking an independent. I don't need anybody kind of thing. And we were like, what can we call that? And we were just like, let's call it an orphan spirit because we worked with them all the time and we would, it took forever to break through the walls to get to them. And so we did that for a few years. So um, I, as I came back to America, I saw the same personalities and different things happening in the church. Oh, I saw it in my life, saw it in my friend's life saw it in the church body in general and just in the way we are. So um, I thought there's something to this. There really is something to this. So I've spent, um, I told some girls earlier today, it's like I spent two or three years in one section and then it took me a few years to get to the next one, to the next one. So since 95, this has been brewing in me and changing me. And even today, new things keep coming to me about it. And I just feel like it's time. So I actually feel like um, in the book, now I haven't studied this out a whole lot, but I'll mention it because it's coming to my spirit. But in the book of Malachi, the last few verses says this on the day of the, um, the final day of the Lord before he returns in the great day of the Lord that uh, Elijah will come, the spirit of Elijah will come and the sons and the fathers, their hearts will turn back to each other. Well, I believe that that's coming from, um, it was messed up in the garden of Eden when Lucifer came and he came to destroy who they thought the father was. And the last words before the 400 years of silence, God said, I will send the spirit of Elijah to, um, to prepare the hearts to come back to the father because he wants to restore the lies that the enemy said about the father god right so and i also believe i think witchcraft and jenny knows more about these things than i do but i think it's prominent today witchcraft sorcery so my thought was what does elijah represent he tore down Baal. he tore down all of these things, you can explain that better, Jenny. But I mean, his, what he represents to me is he tore down Jezebel. He tore down false idols, false worship, the prophets that were lying. He brought it all down. So I believe that this last move of God, if I could say it that way, we are revival, right? But God is doing something where he is turning our hearts back to the father to realize that the lie that the enemy sold us for us to be able to tear down 
the demonic forces that are witchcraft because rebellion is a sin of witchcraft right and so that brings me to the foundation so all right so i want to lay a quick foundation before we get actually into this orphan heart thing so and it's very important because then we know where we're coming from right because then we have a purpose of where we're going so in god's um plan in the garden of eden his strongest um expression to me that i see is love relationship and family love relationship and family and in the garden of eden i'm not going to read every little bit about it because i want to get some good quality stuff in you but genesis 2 7 through 25 we talk he we see that his theme was relationship god breathed into man verse 7 provision god in verse 8 and 9 God planted, placed man in the middle, and then he grew the garden. Read those verses later. I thought that was amazing. Provision. He planted the seeds, put man in the middle, grew the garden. Amazing. Verses eight and nine. So then um, he gave responsibility to man, and with responsibility came authority, right? That's in verse 15. Then there was verse 16 and 17, boundaries and protection. Do not eat from this because this will happen, right? This is God's plan in the Garden of Eden. And then finally, in verse 21 through 25, he made woman, which was family. So again, God's plan in Eden before everything happened was relationship, provision, responsibility with authority, boundaries and protection family right his heart uh, for his children is the same for us today right if we can i really believe i'm really on this thing where i believe that we are a garden enclosed song of solomon says we are a garden enclosed and i feel like the garden of eden is i don't know how to say this other than say i feel like i feel like the garden of eden is kind of inside of myself you know, I have a place where I go secret that I spend with him, right? There's where I, I'm healed. There's where I'm filled. There's where I spend time with him. But there's where I have relationship with him, just like Adam and Eve, because we don't have the garden today, but it's in my walk with him, right? So um, his spirit actually filled Adam to begin life for all of mankind. His spirit was what filled Adam and it began life for all of mankind. Let's see. Abba, Abba was the first face he saw, was the first touch he felt, was the first, um, you know, hand he felt. He was the first everything for Adam. And that's the way it's supposed to be for us today. The father is supposed to be the first. Even Jesus said, I don't do anything unless I ask the father. And we're supposed to be the same way right? All right. So, so then God has this beautiful plan. Well, Lucifer has a plan too. Um, he is the originator of independent thinking or of the orphan heart is what we called it. Um, there's details about that in Genesis three, but I'm not going to touch that, but it began, I don't know if it actually began exactly there, but in Isaiah 14, it talks about that in 12 through 14. It has the five I wills. You girls probably know that it says uh, how you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nation. For you've said in your heart, I will ascend to the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit in the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north position. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. There's a great study in all that, but we're not going to touch that. But I will say that um, his this was the beginning of the formation of the orphan heart slash independent thinking. And it might be easier for people to say independent thinking because I can relate to that than I can't more than I can as an orphan. Most common people, right, that haven't been around orphans or anything. So I call it both. So so he wanted to be exalted above god and he um he even uh let's see the same lie he told eve to um he wanted to have position and authority and that was the same lie that he told adam and eve he said that 
you're, God is withholding something good from you. M mistrust. He's planting seeds of mistrust. God is withholding something more from you. You need to be like him. Well, that's what he desired, right? Isaiah 14. He desired to be up here above God, not only with God, but above God. So there began selfish ambition, right? So Ezekiel 28, 12 through 17, I'm going to read this to you. So those are the two main um, uh, verses or parts in the Bible that always kind of everybody refers to when they're talking about Lucifer, but uh, Jeannie may know some more, but Ezekiel 28, 12 through 17, I'm going to read that real quick to you guys, okay? It says, son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, thus saith the Lord God, you were the seal of protection or perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. We're going to come back to those. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardes, topaz, diamond, barrel, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub that covers. We're coming back there too. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God, the presence of God, right? You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. All I can see is Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence from within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you into a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub covering cherub your heart was lifted up because of your beauty you corrupted corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor so selfish ambition there he 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 corrupted everything for his own desires so i'm going to read exodus i'm going to talk about the covering cherub and let's see, actually, let me say this. So selfish ambition was formed in him during this time. And when that happened, these areas, I say five areas, I believe were birthed during this time. The selfish ambition that he had birthed rebellion, of course, impure motives. When I read that, I could see his impure motives, dishonor disrespect and distortion right so basically an independent heart or a mindset a later and you know an orphan heart so the rebellion is today we see that as the rebellion being against earthly or heavenly authority impure motives and selfish ambition which would be questioning authority being over skeptical in an ungodly way. You know, we, we're to use wisdom, but being skeptical by coming into something and saying, oh, it's not going to work when really God's hand might be on it to try to teach them and learn from them or teach them how to grow. But then disrespect and dishonor with my words, my actions, or the hidden things in my heart. And the selfish ambition tries to distort your view of God, your view of yourself, and your view of others. So I'll say those all one more time. Selfish ambition was formed in him, and it birthed rebellion, impure motives, dishonor, disrespect, and distortion, and distortion. The serpent envied Adam and Eve because, number one, he wanted their position authority and their position right but really god the father loved them so much he knew that would how that would hurt the father god almighty the most so that's when he came in and he's like i'm gonna get these and they're so stupid that they'll listen to me i can trick them is what i'm thinking too <laughs> not that we're stupid but you know <laughs> so 
to hurt God, he wanted to steal that position of authority. So when this happened, they would go from a position of sonship to a position of being a slave to sin or to self, a slave to myself. And I think of my food, my eating, I'm a slave to my flesh sometimes. He wanted them to have an independent mentality, an orphan spirit, just like him. And that leads me to covering. One last thing for the foundation here that we're going to talk about, covering. Oh, covering cherub. Oh, covering cherub. I'm going to read to you. Um, and now in Ezekiel, it said two times about oh, covering cherub. But in Exodus 25, I'm going to read this to you. Exodus 25, verse 20 and 21. And then I have a spirit-filled life Bible, and it has a word wealth, and it talks about what cherub means, and it's really good. So 20 says, and the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above the covering of the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark, and the ark shall be put the test in, in, in the ark shall be put the testimony that I give you. So they, he was a covering cherubim and the word wealth says here that, um, care of is the word, but it means a heavenly body being a representative by carved gold figures on the ark of the covenant. So isn't it interesting how a lot of times in the Old Testament, when an idol was made, it was made into a carved gold image. And he was a covering cherub. So what he actually was excellent in is what he tries to get us tripped up in. And we're going to see that about beauty, perfection, and wisdom. So then it goes on to say, um, his, the name uh, Karov in the Hebrew actually means to bless, praise, and adore. To bless, praise, and adore. So he tries to get us to bless, praise, and adore anything but God the Almighty. My body, my spouse, the lack of money, position, authority, anointing. I mean, he tries for it all. And it also says the idea of this word uh, means covering angel covering angel all right so we know uh, we made it clear that he's a covering angel right well god the father actually is a covering as well and the first two scriptures that came to me when i thought about this was in ezekiel 16 3 through 8 i'll read it to you is when god is speaking to jerusalem and he says, and I'm thinking of orphan spirit. I'm thinking of my independence. I can do this on my own without relying on him and trusting him. He says, you were in an open field. No one pitied you. You were in your own blood. I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Isn't that beautiful? And then Psalm 91, of course, Verse one says, he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. In verse four, it also says, he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings shall take, you shall take refuge. His truth and buckler shall be your shield. And when I read truth there, I just think Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. He is my shield and my buckler, right? So, all right, so. All right, so let me talk a little bit about the enemy's covering because here's where we get tripped up. Um, the enemy's covering. Um, the enemy has a copy of God's desire and plans for our lives. You know, in John 8, 44, I'm going to read it to you. John 8, 44, it says, uh, you are the thought, he's talking to the Jews. He was mad at, Jesus went into the temple and he's arguing with the ones who thought they were very holy you know, Jenny, you know what I'm talking about. And it says, you are the father, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Remember, Jesus is my truth and buckler, my shield, my shield and buckler. And he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, 
he speaks from his own resources, independent thinking, orphan spirit, for he is a liar and the father thereof. So we have God the Father, agape love Father, as our covering in the glory before Eve took a bite of that apple and believed that lie. Suddenly, we've transformed into the, fa the father of lies is now our covering, and we try to cover ourselves with the leaves, whatever can be brought from this earth, earthly things we cover ourselves with. And then I think about, you know, God, before it, the glory of God covered us, and God had to actually send a sacrifice, a sacrifice to really make the covering for us again, which was Jesus, so. All right, so let's see. So Ezekiel 28, verse 12 here. Now I'd like for you, if you'd be willing to write down um, when you hear the Holy Spirit say something to you, like somebody's name, a situation or something that has traumatized you or you've dealt with, I'd like for you to write it down. And then in your own time or however Jenny wants to do it, however she's gonna do it, um, I feel like the Lord is going to help you walk through some things to get some self-deliverance as well, right? I mean, we're big girls. We're big girls. I mean, we all got to do our own thing. There's times I need Jenny and there's times that we got to grow up, right? So, but I want to be there when you pray for her, right? I want you to pray for me too. <laughs> anyway, so, um, all right, Ezekiel 28, 12, it says, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He wants to get us caught up in the areas that he was perfect in. He was the seal of perfection. So what does that look like for me today? I want to break it down. So he wants me to strive to be perfect. And I underlined the word strive. He wants us to strive to be perfect, not resting in God's love, grace, and anointing not resting and i underlined resting to think that we can't do enough to be accepted we're not enough i have to add to me to be better than me we're not enough all right full of wisdom he wants us to struggle with wisdom here i wrote down with spiritual pride he pushes us to desire out of our selfish ambition to be more than my sister or my brother, to be better than them out of self-righteousness. And every one of us do this, in, even if it's in our heart, even me, in my heart, I may think I feel competitive, you know, or little things like that. So the last, the third area is beauty. We know, what, you know what I'm gonna say about that, but I'm gonna say this is a great comparison, the great comparison. Things like, I'm going to talk, I think about material things, physical aspects of our body, spiritual gifts. You see, because I'm not too competitive in my physical body, but I mean, do you know that I need to work on it? But I mean, I feel convicted when I look at you thinking about it. <laughs> but I'm saying I'm just not there yet. But in these other areas, spiritual gifts, I feel like my beauty needs to be more. You know what I'm talking about? I feel like I need to be accepted by everybody in the room and it hurts my heart if I'm not, you know, that's an orphan heart. That is, that's rejection, you know? So um, I want to be, I want my spiritual gifts to be pure. I don't want them necessarily to be big and great. Sometimes I do, but I want them to be pure. And if I want them to be pure, so they will be big and great. I just lost, I messed up, right? All right, so um, let's see what else I got here. And they, it also, the beauty, it's, it, I wrote down here, if we're not the best or the most, we are worthless. And I've heard that lie. You can't just be normal. You have to be this up here or the best. But down in verse 13, it talks about the timbrels and the pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. He pushes us to worship anything but God, anything but God. And if I'm focused on perfection, wisdom, and beauty, 
then I've made those things idols. And, and really, in reality, those three areas can touch every area of my life, every area of my life. Worshiping them above God. All right. So the enemy um, wants to take God's place as our covering. The father of lies wants you to be, wants to be the one that covers you instead of the father of love. And I think I already hit this, but in Genesis three, it says the, the eyes of them were both opened and made themselves coverings. They made themselves out of their works, out of their hands, coverings. So let's go just a hair deeper. All right. So the world's covering always have these three issues guilt shame and fear guilt shame and fear guilt will always point to what you did that you're guilty now i'm still i'm almost finished with the foundation of the orphan heart guilt will point to you that you did it you're guilty you're the blame you're the one shame wraps itself around you and says i'm the problem something's wrong with me, I'm disfigured, I can't get it right. Um, it causes you want to, to hide and cover yourself, right? It's an identity thief, not guilt, shame. Shame is an identity thief. Then there's fear, the third one is fear. It has to do with being exposed. Now I'm thinking of my, uh, my former orphan heart, and my independent thinking protection mode. We're gonna talk about orphans in just a second, how they protect and they hide for self-protection, right? Preservation. Um, fear has to do with being exposed, the truth being found out, being punished, being rejected or alone, unloved and being unsafe, not being protected, not being protected. So these three areas, come out of being under the father of lies covering, right? Lucifer's covering, so Satan's. Um, out of these three things, develop um, uh, an orphan heart. It'll form and develop because guilt, shame, and fear of our past experiences distorts our identity today. Guilt, shame, and fear of our past experiences distort our identity today someone with an orphan heart will cover who they really are inside they'll pretend and be fake every one of us have done it a million times and because of shame and fear not because they're guilty but because of the feeling of shame and fear right but their true identity in god is distorted it causes you to blame and hide it causes you to blame and hide from natural and spiritual fathers or authority in general. Have you ever met somebody who just never could work anywhere? They always got fired. They always got mad at the authority. They always had some issue. You know, I know nobody in this room is, has ever been like that, have they? <laughs> I have, but so, all right. So blame. So um, blame will not take responsibility for its mistakes. It's lacking humility, right? The responsibility and the authority work together. If we don't take it, we don't give it. We don't get it. We don't give it away, actually. So let me summarize this part. Real, This is really a good part here. So the enemy's covering. The orphan heart begins with guilt, shame, and fear, which distort our identity then we will hide and blame others, basically, Adam and Eve, all right? Now, like an orphan, if we don't find love in a church, relationship, or a group, we will search to find it somewhere else. That's when we hop and go from here and here and here. Even unknowingly, it might be spouses, it might be jobs, it might be churches, it might be, you know, whatever, thinking that we can't be loved and we're unworthy and full of fear. But perfect love cast out fear. So I asked God, even today, he just gave this to me. And I said, so what about your covering? If that's the three things, what are your three things uh, that combat guilt, shame, and fear? And he said, 2 Timothy 1, 7. 
God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And that would be a good study to compare those two, those three out with each other. So, and in verse nine, he's confirming our identity. Like these three, guilt, shame, and fear distort our identity. In verse nine, power, love, and a sound mind confirm our identity. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Jesus Christ before time began. So under Lucifer's covering, we hide and blame. Under God the Father's covering, we have purpose and grace. Purpose and grace before, before the Garden of Eden. Before, before. I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. I love this teaching. I may be biased, but I just love it. <laughs> it is really, really good. Like it's, really good. Foundation part has been amazing. Oh my gosh. I'm so I mean, without that, I don't, I mean, I feel like I can understand orphaned mentality and stuff, but if I don't know where it's which umbrella am I under? And now when somebody does something to me, I just see myself standing under this ugly black umbrella that's from the devil and I'm like nope I'm getting under this umbrella and it clicks for me it just clicks all right so the girls I'm moving fast I'm a hot potato tonight because I'm moving fast all right so what's an orphan so in the Webster's it says a child who has lost both parents to death and to or to abandonment or has no protection of a family unit and has to care for itself. All I can think of is the Garden of Eden. All I can think of is when they cover themselves with a stinking leaf. So this is what I saw when I was working with the orphanages there, (laughs) the orphans there. I saw loneliness, abandonment, fear, feeling unsafe, walls up, guardedness they're always kind of in defense mode some of them were self-reliant very street smart a wandering sadness helplessness unrest it makes me so i feel heavy when i read these things because it's so real um uh skilled manipulators they live by their own rules They live by the five I wills that Lucifer had to do. And I have um, a God's idea about the five I wills later, what he, how he wants us to live by these five I wills anyways. So these things I saw in these children, when I came back home, I saw them in the church and I saw them in the churches there, but I didn't pay attention to them so much because I was focused on the kids or whatever. But then when there's no children around me, and I go to the churches that I was at, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm in an orphanage. I'm in an orphanage. Because when you walk into a room, there's three different types of uh, children that I saw. And I know they could be fancy names, but I can't think of any. I've tried. But um, there's the first one that I noticed was always the shy one. Very standoffish. They won't look you in the eye. They don't want to be seen, fearful, timid, feel unloved, unwanted, unworthy of love, or even to be blessed. I mean, I can see that in the church today. I can see that in my workplace. I mean, I can see that. It's so, it's like you can see it in everybody's life now, some portion. And I've been every one of these, every one of these. And sometimes I have to make myself not be, you know, that person again. The second one are the try hards. They want all of your attention or all of the room's attention. They will work hard for approval and acceptance for their deeds or their works. If they can be good enough or perfect enough, then they get to be loved, but not until then, or they get to be chosen. They're very competitive on a scale of slightly competitive to extremely competitiveness. Um, the tough ones, 
Number three, the tough one. They act like they really don't care. They look away constantly, but they really are listening because they've been hurt. You know, it all comes from pain that they can't look at you because they don't trust you. They don't trust anybody. They've been hurt and don't want to trust again. Authority has been hard on them and can be uh, bitter about, and they can be bitter about it. They stay away from relationships. You ever seen um, a woman or a man who's divorced? How many times they can't get close? They can't bond. You know what I mean? Um, they they are just want something. Um, you just want something from them anyway. Is their mentality? You're using me anyways. Um, a lot of people, a lot of ladies or men who've been involved in prostitution, they are this tough one. They have to be for survival, right? Usually, um, let's see, I have made it this far on my own and I don't need you to survive. I am self-sufficient, independent thinking because I have to be self-protective, right? And they will make vows. And we'll talk about that briefly at the end. They make vows that I will never let that happen to me again. Ungodly vows. Ungodly vows. That was Jenny Foley. I'm oh just my saying. gosh. That was who I was. I was the tough one. Because I had been hurt so much. And I would make vows. You ain't never going to do this to me again. Even like, even I can even remember just a few years ago, like after I got saved. Yeah. I mean, because church hurt, church hurt is probably some of the worst hurt that I've ever experienced in my life. Oh, for sure. So I would make those vows that I wouldn't allow that leader to do that to me again or whatever. You were talking about that. And I was like, my God, she's talking to me. I just yeah. had to share. Like, if you know me, you know, I'm very transparent. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that was where I was. And I've just now moved it. Like once God exposed to me that I was dealing with the orphan spirit, which was in the within the last year. I'm just now moving into that place mm-hmm. where I, I'm free from it and understand what it was that I was operating yeah, in yeah, yeah. at that moment. It's crazy. Yeah. It's just crazy. And how we get free from it is to recognize it. Yeah. You, you can't get free if you don't recognize it. That's basic, basic, basic. Yeah, that's basic. Okay, done. All right, so um, let's see. Buh, buh, buh. There are three areas. Let's see. So I believe, like, I think I said this before that we're a garden in the song of Solomon. It talks about, uh, in four verse 12, it says a garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, which is talking about the church or in one, of, in, a, in a portion of that. And in five, one, it says, I have come to my garden, my sister, my spouse, I have gathered the myrrh and my spices. So many places, more places that he talks about a garden. And just two days ago, I thought about um, God kept bringing back to me the garden, the garden, the garden, the garden. And Jason Upton sings a song about the garden. You got to look it up. It's a really good one. But I feel like this garden, I can't go back to the Garden of Eden and, and fix it, but he can in this garden, right? And that is the beauty of it. So I feel like, well, why did you use the word garden? Why are you still talking about the garden? Because it's all about the garden. In the end, He's going to restore the relationship that was stolen, the lies that were told about the Father, God Almighty, the lies and the distortion. He's going to fix it, just like in Mike Malachi, the last verses. I'm going to fix all this. And that spirit of Jezebel, witchcraft, and everything else that comes with it, Jenny, you know, I don't know, is going to come down. And then restoration is going to be made like the garden, the way it was started from the beginning and so much more. So, okay. So I said, so um, he showed me these four things. He said, they're seeds, seeds of rejection. Of course, they look like this, not being good enough. And I didn't go extensive here because you girls are smart enough to know. So they look like not being good enough, striving to be accepted, self-promotion. Those seeds birth competition. Those seeds birth competition. Now, God's rebuttal to that and his seeds are actually peace and acceptance. Peace and acceptance. All right. The second seed, 
his response is the peace and acceptance. So the second seed was abandonment. I'm thinking of an orphan that's a child because in the on the streets they have their own mafia. Like they have their their own world and they would soon cut me and leave me under a building then I mean they got to take care of each other. And then they have little sisters that they're trying to watch over and they pay somebody to watch over them while they're gone so nobody comes and does anything to them. It's crazy. Crazy. So the second one is an abandonment and those seeds look like being unloved, unworthy, loneliness, unwanted, isolation, and self-sufficient, self-sufficient. Those seeds birth depression. God's response to those seeds, he gives you joy and he gives you a family. To abandonment, he responds with joy and family. The third seed, is abuse. Those seeds look like this is my fault. Shame, guilt, insecurity, mistrust, blame, self-protection. The abuse births fear and anxiety. fear and anxiety and God's response to that perfect love casts out fear period when you know perfect love and that's agape love that's a baptism in love like Jesus was in Mark or Matthew you want to talk about that and the last one is um ungodly criticism um, seeds of ungodly criticism look like Compares, comparing you to someone else, hope deferred, being uh, feeling yucky just about yourself, you know, dissatisfaction with who you are, self-approval and self-protection. This is a really good one. So ungodly criticism births performance. That's crazy. Birth performance. So God's response to ungodly criticism is identity. Godly, his identity. So because of those seeds, um, I feel like the orphan heart learns to live for themselves and not from God, not from a position of his love, his embrace. I'm not talking about ooey gooey. I'm talking about a position of I have authority or I'm in a position of grace. I've been covered by the blood. You know, we tend to do things for ourselves, striving to do that. Um, no one's going to do it for me anyway, so I got to do it, right? So um, let's see here. So the example of the five I wills that are manifested today um, or how we see them in our lives in a negative way is self-protection, self-protection, self-provision, self-approval, self-promotion, self-reliance protection provision approval promotion and reliance isn't that good that's let's see the opposite of god's plan in the garden right that's if we're under the covering of um the enemy right let's see here all right so i'm gonna so um John 14, 18 is written in red letters. I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. And if you write down, you read this on your own girls, but Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. So um, the next portion is just about um, the spirit of adoption, um, 
Jesus being baptized and John the beloved and some other things. But I'd like to give you a list of six things that I have discovered that will help me do this, take care of these issues on my own, right? Because I don't want to leave you without, because that's probably a good cutoff point for me, Jenny. But um, number one, when we, I pray to be delivered from these things or to get out from under the umbrella of the enemy is number one, I recognize it. I don't stay there. I get under the right covering, under the right covering. And number two, I repent of my part in that situation. I repent of my part in that situation. Here's the hard part. Even if it was against my will, I repent that I was even in that situation. I think of being raped. I know that's a touchy situation. I've experienced that, so I can openly talk about that. But I had to repent that I was even in that situation, even though I didn't do anything. You know what I'm talking about? So, but, and then here's the next part, the another part that I take part in. I kept the bitterness. I kept the unforgiveness, the anger, the mistrust. So I have to repent of that. Repent of being in that situation and then repent of the tombstones that you've carried around in your back pocket, the graveyard of the deadly things, you know, repent of those things you felt in your heart because no freedom will come until bitterness and unforgiveness is gone. I don't care who you are. I don't care any, what about anything until that stuff is really gone. And he knows the hidden parts. He knows that I only could do it halfway one time. And then the next time I could go a little farther and he's a gentleman and he takes care of me and he'll walk me through whatever I can give him that day. Right. All right. Number three is to release, forgive and bless. Can you see that difference from number two? You're repenting of bitterness and anger and unforgiveness. Number three, you're releasing it. That's a whole big step, right? Um, release, forgive, and bless. And when I say release, I'm also talking about those vows. Those vows that I said, there'll never be another man cheat on me or, you know, however. Judgments, release the ju judgments you've had toward your sisters in Christ or your brothers in Christ or, you know, a black person or a Chinese person or a Russian person. My dad hated Russian people. And then I went to the Ukraine. They speak Russian. I mean, I was cut off and that's not even, a. I was cut off, cut off. But I mean, of all people to go to, he said, was a Russian. And I was like, I don't know anything about it. I, would, I don't know. I just know it's where I'm supposed to go. So, so release, forgive, and bless. You guys know, you're old enough in the Lord to know, right? I don't have to explain any of that. But I did write down here, don't live in the tombs. Don't live where the past memories are in the graveyard, right? In Mark 5, two different times when Jesus came, it referred to that man who was set free from legion as the man who lived among the tombs, among the past things that happened to him. I mean, I can, there's so many people that still stay there, even if it's secretly in your heart, you know, there is a, a life where you can breathe. We have to get out from that. We have to get out of the tombs. You have to get out of the tombs. And number four, ask for an encounter with the father with a baptism in love ask for an encounter with the father with a baptism in love next time we meet we're going to talk about that when jesus was baptized how it's significant for us today in our everyday life uh, you wouldn't think it but it, it's just amazing but so that is something that you will find your identity i mean he will give you your identity in that baptism of love. Jenny can't give it to you. I can't, nobody, you can't give it to each other, but there's something that happens when you're alone with him in the garden. He gives you your identity. 
And this baptism of love, agape love, will heal your griefs, your hurts, your shame, your blame, everything, right? Now, this, this one is uh, last two things. Number five is try for restoration with honor, if at all possible, because God is a God of reconciliation, right? Sometimes it's not possible. It Actually, I've done a lot of symbolic uh, reconciliations because I didn't have the guts to do it face to face. So, you know, I might have to do that one day, but I've just, at least I've moved that way, right? So, and the person that uh, came into my life that destroyed a lot of things is in a federal prison right now. So I don't know, you know, I don't know. I just can't right now. So uh, for murder, for murder, he's in prison for murder. So, I mean, does it matter to me that much? Actually, I don't, I mean, I did some symbolic things before, but now it's like, eh, it's okay. It's part of a testimony I get to help other people with. So I'm, I'm on a good side of it. So I don't feel like I need to do anymore unless he would tell me later. But so just be led by the Lord with that because sometimes it can cause more problems. There was somebody who came to me and said, um, I was so mad at you and so offended with you and blocked puked all over me, vomited all over me spiritually. And I had no idea. And I left feeling violated. Like that person just scratched my eyeballs out. That wasn't God. So if it's not done in honor and still not exalting that person, but preferring that person, even though they did you wrong, even though they're the one in the flesh or whatever, I'm a little in flesh too, or I'm a lot in the flesh or whatever. If you do it with honor, that person will walk away feeling loved. I don't, that's just my experience. I mean, everybody has a different experience. You know what I'm talking about? But the goal is reconciliation with honor and love. Doesn't always happen that way. I mean, it doesn't, but that's God's goal. And if I can mature into that, then like I've been rebuked by a pastor for doing some things that were really ungodly and brought into the office and sat down and said we found this what did you do why did you do this and talked for about 30 minutes and I walked out of there floating on a cloud like I had just been released from something and happy that I got rebuked and I don't get it to sing for the next two weeks you know or whatever it was so I mean there's a way to restore people and deal with issues right so I know you guys know what I'm talking about Last thing is ask God to give you a spiritual father. I actually am still looking for that person. I don't know. I've had a few. I've actually just had two, but they've, I've moved out of their lives and one is no longer alive and such. But I mean, the goal is to have a spiritual father, I'm not talking about a mother, I'm talking about a father. There's something different in there, Jenny something different and they've got to have pure motives like I've been approached by a few people like would you like to be a spiritual daughter to me and I thought yeah at first and then the more time I was with this person I was like it's not pure I don't feel good about it so then I you know asked to be released and stuff but anyway so but God will he's faithful even though I don't have might not have one on earth you know, he's going to be my father until, but he will, I believe, take care of all that. But that's all I got for right now, Jenny. So. Well, thank you. You're uh, welcome. For one, thank you. Like the whole um, first 30 minutes, I found myself searching myself. Yeah. And I don't know about you guys, but that's something important that we need to do when we begin to hear revelation. Like a lot of people will hear revelation and they're like, oh, I need to tell so-and-so that they need this revelation. But if you can't first search yourself and make sure you're clean, you have no business going to anybody yeah. else about what they're dealing with. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anytime I am under a teaching or listen to a teaching that makes me search myself, it makes me excited. So thank you. 
Like, Aww. like I had a good understanding of what this, this orphan spirit or orphan heart was, but the whole foundation that you laid out was absolutely phenomenal and brought completely new revelation um, awesome. and understanding. And I'm actually really, really excited for um, the 23rd when we get to finish it up. Yeah. So um, on the 23rd at seven, we'll meet back here in zoom. We'll talk about it. And then at the end, um, if Marianne wants to pray over, she can, if not, I will pray over us. Um, We'll just go through some like cleansing in the moment. It, I call it mass deliverance. You can call it whatever you want to. Um, yeah. It's all fun in my eyes. So <laughs> um, we'll do it that way. Um, and for now, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. And then we can just, um, everybody can come off mute and we can talk. Okay. Again, Marianne, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you.